please open your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. In our study of the book of Romans, we have amazingly enough arrived at chapter 12 after lo these many months. One of the presents that we got for Christmas was a book about the golden days of old Hollywood. It's a book that I have uh, enjoyed reading through a great deal. One of the things in the book that really struck me was the code of conduct that used to be ascribed to by all of the motion picture industry. And uh, as I read through it, I was absolutely amazed to find that today every one of those rules are violated in virtually every movie that comes out of Hollywood. They used to ascribe to the fact that uh, movies should always have a moral tone, that crime should never be portrayed as something that pays, uh, that Religion should never be held up in a disparaging light. That uh, ministers should not be held up in a way that would bring ridicule upon the true ministry. That they shouldn't suggest that adultery is something that is acceptable. That they should never present love affairs as though uh, sex outside of marriage was something that was acceptable behavior. Now, these are just some of the things I'm taking off. You should see the list that was there. And you know, up until the 60s, the movie industry ascribed to that. I remember when I was a very small boy, uh, my mother took me to see Gone with the Wind. Actually, I was 10 years old. And uh, I remember how racy everybody thought it was near the end when Clark Gable said, frankly, dear, I don't give a damn, you know. I mean, you know, we thought, wow, that's really racy for the films. And then I remember when Jane Russell came out with Howard Hughes' film, The Outlaw. While that film was banned in Boston, there were church groups that marched against it. And yet that would be rated uh, G today, fit for general exposure. I just began to think about movies that uh, have been very popular in the last few years, and I realized that in every one of them, the idea that uh, having uh, a full sexual relationship outside of marriage was presented as the norm. Everybody does it. Well, that all began to come to mind this morning as I read this passage. Read with me, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, or on the basis of the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world. The, Greek, the original Greek literally says this, stop being conformed to this world system. In other words, this, this is an exhortation to stop something that is going on. And in all of our lives, we're constantly being conformed to the patterns of thinking of the world, to that which is in for this generation, to that which is in vogue. And the scripture says, stop being conformed to the way the world thinks and the way the world does. But, by contrast, constantly allow yourself to be transformed. Now, I'm giving you the original Greek significance here. The verb is a command. It's in the imperative mood. The verb is in the present tense, which means to keep on doing something. 
It's in the passive voice, which means the subject receives the action. So when you put all of those grammatical points together, it's a command for us to continually allow ourselves to be transformed. In other words, God does the transforming. We allow him to do it. And this should be a constant process. He says, constantly allow yourself to be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. That you may put to the test and approve, literally, what the will of God is. That which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, we've been studying the wonders of God's grace as we've gone through the book of Romans. We have studied how that God chose us out of a world that is determined to reject God and go its own way. We've studied how God has chosen us before the foundation of the world. When Christ hung on the cross, he had your name on his heart. We studied how Christ removed every barrier that our sins built between God and us. How that the moment that we accept Jesus Christ into our life, he pardons every sin that we'll ever commit in our lifetime. He forgives us all sin, past, present, and future. And he gives us eternal life. He brings us into God's forever family. And God, te God tells us that God proved his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners and enemies of God, Christ died for us. He has put us into union with Christ and made us co-heirs with Christ of all that he has in eternity future. He has given us an inheritance that is undefiled and fades not away, that is reserved in heaven for us. And the Lord says in Romans chapter 8, let's just look at that very quickly, where he summarizes the wonders of what he has done for us freely. Romans 8, 38 and 39. After what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross, and to all who receive that as a gift by faith, he says, this is true of you. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In union with Christ, nothing can separate us from the love of God. You know, because we're in an inseparable, organic union with Christ, established by the Holy Spirit the moment that we believe in Christ. Because we're in that union, God sees us as bone of Christ's bone and flesh of his flesh. God sees us as inseparably united with Christ. And because of that, you know, he loves you, he loves me with the same amount of love that he loves his son. We're accepted, it says in Ephesians 1, 6, in the beloved. We're accepted in the beloved. We have the same acceptance that his son does. Because of that, nothing can separate us from God's love. Look what he says cannot separate us. Death or life can't do it. Now look at that. You know, fear of death is the, is the basis of all neurosis. Psychiatrists have finally found, come around to find out. The Bible told us that over 2,000 years ago, but psychiatrists have come around to agree. They've rejected Freud's basic thesis that uh, this, the basic cause of neuroses is our wrong potty training and sex hangups. But today, they recognize that the, the most basic cause of human neuroses is fear of death. And guys like uh, Evil Knievel, the daredevils, they're the ones who fear death the most. They have this constant love-hate relationship with death. But we all have a fear of death. But you know something? Christ says death can't separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. We don't have to fear death because death can't separate us from God. We continue to live. The moment that a Christian dies, he goes on to be 
consciously face to face with the Lord from that moment on forever. They're never separated. The last breath here is the first breath of heaven. Life cannot separate us. That means that from the time you accept Christ to the time you go home, that whatever you do in that life can't separate you from his love. And it goes on to say, nor angels, nor principalities. Angels refers to God's angels. Principalities refer to fallen angels, demons. I don't know whether you've ever come in contact with real demonic personalities before I have. I had a demon-possessed man suddenly lunge at me when I was talking to him. He lunged at me with a butcher knife and I ducked and he just ripped my shirt right off my back. By the grace of God, I didn't kill him and I, when he did that, I jumped up and I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to be still. And he froze. But you know something, if you've ever come into contact with the powers of demons, they're, they're powerful but not more powerful than God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, things present, that is, nothing in the present can separate us from the love of God. Now, things to come can separate us. Nor powers, that means any power in any realm, nothing, no power conceivable can separate us from God's love which is secured to us in Christ Jesus. Nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing. Now here's where the uh, theological group called the Armenians say that uh, you can lose your salvation. They say, well, nothing can take us out of union with Christ. Nothing can cause us to lose our salvation, but we can cause ourselves to lose our salvation. Let me ask you, are you a created thing? Yes, you certainly are. Well, it says no created thing can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ and you can't do it yourself. You can't undo what Christ did on the cross. If you could, you would. If we could, there'd be no, there wouldn't be one human being in heaven. If salvation depended in any ways upon men, we wouldn't be there. But it depends entirely upon the finished work of Christ. Now, those, that's a summary of the work of the mercy of God that Jesus Christ did for all of us at the moment he died on the cross for us, and all of that is given to us the moment we receive it by faith. And so now back to 12.1. He says, I urge you, I beg you, literally. Therefore, brethren, on the basis of the mercies of God, on the basis of all that Christ did for you freely without charge, on the basis of everything that Jesus Christ has done for each one of us and given us by grace, which means you can't earn it or deserve it, on the basis that all he has done, God says, I beg you to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. You know, we are priests. God has made each one of us kings and priests. This is a work of a priest. This, is, this whole wording here is cast in the light of the priesthood. Now, the Levitical priest, under the law of Moses, used to bring an animal approved by God, a certain kind of animal for each sacrifice, and that animal would be brought to the altar and laid upon the altar. And that animal would be put to death in place of the sins of the people. They would lay their hands on the head of the animal, confess the sins of the people, on the, identifying those sins with the animal, the animal would be killed and offered on an altar as a burnt sacrifice. That was the work of the priesthood then. But you know what our greatest work as a priest is today? To offer ourselves to God as a sacrifice. 
And I want you to know this. God doesn't say, do it or I'll finish with you. Do it or I'll cast you out. He doesn't say that. God doesn't say, do it or I'll get even with you. He doesn't say, do it or I'll plug you. Now notice what he does. God says, I beseech you on the basis of the mercies of God. This is a word of entreaty to our wills. God says, I don't make you do this. I ask you to do this. Your greatest work as a priest to me, the greatest offering you can ever give me back is to, on the basis as you see what I've done for you, out of love for me, to love me back for the love I've given you, is to offer yourself as a sacrifice, but not as a dead one. This is where it becomes even more glorious. Not as a dead sacrifice, but as a living sacrifice. And the word here, the verb present, is in the aorist tense in the original Greek. And by contrast, the present, which means continuously, this is something that means that you do it once. Something you do once at a point of time. And this means to make a determined, thought-through decision. This is not something that happens when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. This is something God appeals to you to do after you're his child, after you have learned what he has done for you. You couldn't make an intelligent decision like about what he's asking here until you understand what he has done for you. But God says, now that you know what I've done to you, I don't force you to do this, but I beseech you to present once and for all your bodies as a living sacrifice to me. In a sense, God is saying, give me the title deed of your life once and for all. Present to me your body. Now, why does he say your body? Why, does he, why doesn't he say present your mind? Because he is emphasizing the vehicle through which the Holy Spirit can live the life of Christ. Our bodies can be transformed from that which was a slave of the world and a slave of sin. Our bodies can be transformed into that which manifests the very life of Christ. And that's what he wants. Do you know something? I'm convinced no one can be filled with the Holy Spirit until he has presented himself once and for all in a thoughtful, reasoned out decision to God as a living sacrifice. This has to be your own free decision. But I'll tell you something. On the basis of what we know God has done for us, it's the most reasonable decision that anyone can make. You know why? We think we know what will make us happy. I want you to look back. If you look back in your life, as I can certainly run mine through my mind right now, think back on all the decisions that you've made about things that you thought would make you happy and when you got them, you weren't happy with. Think about the times that uh, the boy that you thought you couldn't live without or the girl that you thought you couldn't live without or a possession you thought you couldn't live without, the energy you expended to, to get it, the, the things that you went through to obtain things, and then the things that didn't work out. You know, the Christian has the most wonderful privilege, and that is when we give God the title deed of our lives, God who knows everything, who knows the future, 
totally. Then as we moment by moment walk in dependence upon the Holy Spirit, God guides us in our lives into that which will make us truly fulfilled and therefore truly happy. Now, our emotions get involved naturally, and we think we know what's going to make us fulfilled and truly happy, and we'll find that after we commit our lives to God as a living sacrifice, there are going to be times when we come up against something, and we say, Lord, I don't care, I want this. But you know something? I have found, I remember when I gave the title deed of my life to Christ, gosh, it's been many years ago, it's been over 30 years ago, I'd been a Christian for about four years. And I had just learned out of the book of Romans and the book of Galatians and some other books of the New Testament what God had done for me. And as I began to accept the fact that God loved me that way, it was the first time I ever knew that I was really loved by anyone. I was so full and overwhelmed with God's love that I couldn't, I just wanted to express my love back. And then I was challenged by this verse, and I said, Lord, I don't know the future, but I don't care what it is. Whatever the future holds, I know you hold the future. I give you my life. I give you this body to work through. And whatever my choices are in the future, in the future they're countermanded right now. I want you to have the final say. I make the choice once and for all for my whole life. Yours is the will I want. Yours is the final say. I have had some real disputes with God since then, but you know something? I've already given him the final say. And by the grace of God, he has taken me up by the nap of my neck out of more wrong choices, pulled me through them, brought me through, and I, you know, I came through some of them kicking and screaming, and then on the other side, I find, gee, you were right again, Lord. I'm really happy that you did that. It's been a wonderful life. Not without its pain, but a wonderful life. I wouldn't change being God's slave for anything else because that's what I am. I'm God's slave. It's what Paul proudly called himself. Paul, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, called an apostle. I am a bond slave of Jesus Christ, and that is my most cherished title. Sometimes I dispute with him, but I've given him my life. It belongs to him. Have you? It's one thing to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's another thing to make us a determined and reason choice to offer yourself as a living sacrifice to him and choose for him to be the Lord of your life. Have you chosen for him to be the Lord of your life? He hears you if you do this. Let me tell you, he takes you seriously. But there is no wiser choice. Now look what he says. I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. That is your spiritual service of worship. Your body is now acceptable to God because the old sin nature has already been judged and God has already forgiven you for the presence of the old sin nature that's still in you. Your body is acceptable to work for the Holy Spirit to work through. And he says, this is your spiritual service of worship. This is your highest act as a priest before God, is to give yourself. And he says, stop being conformed to this world. You know, I have never, there, there has never been an age where there's been such an onslaught on the mind of people to be conformed to the world system. And do you know who controls the world system, the thoughts, the end thing, that which is in fashion, in the, in, the, in the action realm, that which is in vogue? Do you know who controls the world system? Whether it's, whether it, humanly speaking, appears to be good or bad, you know who controls it? Satan. 
And God says, I want you to stop being conformed to this world. But you can't even begin to stop being conformed to this world until you decide who is the Lord of your life. But God says, look, isn't it reasonable on the basis of what I've done for you? Isn't it reasonable? God says, living with someone that you're not married to is wrong, no matter what the world says. Smoking pot is wrong. I don't care if everybody does it. Overdoing it with alcohol, getting drunk is wrong. It's not wrong to have a drink, but it's wrong to get drunk. And if you have a tendency toward alcoholism, it's wrong to drink at all. God says, I don't care what they do in the movies. It's not the pattern for the Christian life. God says, stop being conformed to this world system. But be, allow yourself to constantly be transformed. How can you be transformed? How can your mind be renewed? It's a beautiful process. Your mind can be transformed to where the good and acceptable and perfect will of God is worked out in your life daily. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and with this we will finish for today. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. 2 Corinthians three eighteen. Behold, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as, an, and it, as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, of being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. What does it mean to have an unveiled face? The scripture says that the Israelites still have a veil over their heart that blinds them to the meaning of the law of Moses. The law of Moses was never given as a way of salvation. It was never given as a means to clean up your life and make you acceptable to God. The law of Moses can only show you what's wrong with you. To have an unveiled face is to see that God doesn't expect you to try to keep an external law. He's given us the Holy Spirit to write the law in our hearts. And what does that mean? It means the Holy Spirit puts God's desires in our heart and then gives us the power to fulfill those desires. And how does that happen? Because when we understand we stand before God by grace, we don't stand before God by works, we stand by grace. We realize that the Holy Spirit will work out God's righteousness in us if we simply stop trying to live by our own human strength and choose to live moment by moment by the Holy Spirit. And it says, with, when we understand that, we behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. You know what the mirror is? The mirror is the Word of God. The Word of God mirrors to us the image of Christ, what He is like, what He does. And as we ask the Holy Spirit to teach us the Word of God, He mirrors back the character of Christ and the image of Christ to us. And as we depend upon the Holy Spirit, He moment by moment conforms us to that same image, it says, as, by the, as from the Lord the Spirit. Now that is the process that begins when you make a once and for all decision to give Christ your life, to give him the title deed. But there's something in verse 2 that I want to expand a bit more. Let's read them together. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, this statement does not come out of a vacuum. It really springs off of chapter 11. And several weeks ago when we studied chapter 11, we saw that as Paul talks about the wisdom of God, and how he deals with Israel as a nation and how he deals with reaching out to the Gentiles, how that Israel still has a future. He's going to bring them back ultimately. But he showed how that Israel's failure in faith 
and their rejection temporarily has resulted in the grace of God being turned to the Gentiles in full measure. But he shows that there'll come a time when that will be turned back to his ancient people and they'll be brought back into all of the blessings that God unconditionally promised them in the Old Testament. So as he looks at the overall wisdom of God, chapter 11 ends with praise and that's why he starts off with chapter 12. He says, I urge you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. And we saw how that reached back to all that's been said in the book of Romans. The mercies of God, all that God has done to save us through Jesus Christ. And so he urges us to present our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. And we talked about that last week, how this is a once and for all presentation of ourself to God, giving the title deed of our life to God, electing his will as final even before we know it because we know that he loves us in such a way that he will only want that which is best for us. He will only give us that which will fulfill us the most. And so with that understanding of his mercies, we can, with all our hearts, present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God Verse 2 again, it says, and stop being conformed, literally, to this world. The original Greek, it's the present tense. And that means stop doing something that's going on. Stop being conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Stop being conformed to this world. We talked about this a little bit last week, but there's something I want to emphasize. There has never been a time in the history of mankind when Satan had such marvelous tools to control our minds. Never. When it says stop being conformed to this world, the word conform means to be pressed into a mold from the outside and the infiltration of things coming from the outside. To be conformed by being molded into something. And it's stop being conformed to this world. And the word world is a word that it's literally age, not the cosmos, but age. Stop being conformed to all the thought patterns and the characteristics of this world. And Satan has, as I say, the ultimate tools to use today. Because today, the mass means of communication, the rapid means of travel, means that he can spread evil and he can spread a way of thinking as never before in history. It used to be that in the large cities you would find that the, the, the uh, style of this age, the various kinds of depravity that would spread among the people rapidly there would take five to ten years to spread to a place, let's say, like Iowa. But you know something? The depravity of the major cities today is instantly the depravity of the rural communities. Why? because of television, because of movies, because of music. And now we have the tremendously expanded capability to affect people's minds by this rapid means of communication and dissemination of information. I've never said a whole lot about these things before, but the Lord really laid it on my heart this morning as I was talk, uh, talking with him and looking at this about what does this mean? Stop being conformed to the age. To really exhort you to watch what you allow to be put into your mind. You know, even the advertisement today is according to the standards of this world. Everything is almost sexually based. Hold your place here and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. 
I'm going to refer you to a couple of passages. Hold your finger in Ephesians chapter 2. And also I want you to look at 1 John chapter 5. Verse 19. We'll read 1 John 5, 19 first. We know that we are of God, those who have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We know that we are of God. And the whole world lies in the power of who? The evil one. The whole world, and this is the word cosmos here, and that means the whole world orderly world system that which keeps this whole world system's thoughts together the whole pattern of thinking the whole way of doing things the characteristics of selfishness greed and so forth all of that is under the power of the evil one and who is that satan we know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Now you compare that with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you find that the world system will continue to be in the power of Satan until when? Until Jesus Christ returns to destroy his power in one cataclysmic judgment you know this is a side issue but it's one that's very important this puts the lie to kingdom now right there the dominionists the kingdom now teachers that you know we're going to conquer the world and so forth the bible says this world is under the power of the evil one the christian is an alien on enemy territory and we are to lead people to christ out of that world system and we're to seek to affect it, but we're told very definitely that it's not going to be destroyed until the stone cut without hands, as Daniel chapter 7 says, comes and destroys the whole world organization and system. It strikes the picture of Gentile world power, which is the great image, in the feet and destroys it all in one fell swoop. And it says that a stone cut without hands will do that. Who is that? Well, obviously, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. But for now, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one, the fashions of the age, that which is in, the in music, the, the plays, the way that things are developed are all under the power of the evil one. That doesn't mean that they are as rampantly evil as they could be. It doesn't mean that they are necessarily gross, but it means the way that the thought pattern is developed is anti-God, it's man-centered, and it's under the control of Satan. A thing does not have to be culturally or socially repugnant to be evil. God says that everything that, is, that leads people away from faith in Jesus Christ is evil. And the scripture says all of that is under the power of Satan. Now look at Ephesians chapter 2. And you who were dead, for verse 1, and you who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked, According to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Now here we have an insight into how Satan works. It says, you formerly walked according to the course of this world. Once again, it's the course of this age or the fashion of this age. You once walked in that when you were apart from God, before you were born again. It's possible to get entangled again in it as a Christian, but you're once enmeshed in it without any hope of being apart from it. 
You once walked according to the fashion of this age or the course of the world. This is the idea that Satan fashions all of the thought patterns, the, the uh, way that people see things in the world. That's why today it's very, very unwise and foolish to go to certain movies. I'm not getting legalistic, but I'll tell you something. I, I've been convicted myself about wasting my time, but more than that, damaging my mind by some of the things that's on television and that's in the movies. Because these things go into your thought process and they are alien to the things of God and they begin to destroy your commitment to Christ. You program your brain in much the same way that you can program a computer. There's one difference, of course. We've got free choice and free will and we're able to operate this system. I was listening with fascination yesterday to Nancy Missler's tapes from the women's retreat that were very good. And uh, I noted uh, one of the illustrations she used. It was very good. Her husband's a computer expert, so I'm sure she talked this over with him, Chuck Missler. But she was talking about the brain, that is the physical brain, is like the hardware of a computer. But it's not to be confused with the mind. The mind is something different than the brain. The mind is like the software of the computer. The mind is the whole thought patterns, the forms of thought, and the way you think. And our greatest battle, the greatest battle that takes place on this earth is not going to be on the, on the battlefield, even at that time there'll be nuclear war. The greatest battles that take place on this earth as far as God is concerned, and as far as you and I are concerned, are not there, they take place right here. The greatest battle. Because Satan is always after the mind of the Christian. There's where the battle is won. There's where the battle is lost. And so we have to realize that we have a dedicated enemy and that he is very clever. Hold your place here for a second, Ephesians 2, and look at Ephesians 6. Beginning with verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord. Let me give you a literal translation from the ori original Greek. Finally, I command you, allow yourself to be strengthened by the Lord. This is another one of those very unusual constructions in the Greek. It's, it's an imperative mood with a passive voice. Now, the imperative mood means it's a command, but the passive voice means that you receive the action. So you're commanded to receive the action of the verb, which is be strengthened. So it means, I command you, allow the Lord to fill you with his strength. Now, how can you do that? There's only one way a Christian can be strengthened by the Lord, and that's by being filled with the Holy Spirit. Allow yourself to be strengthened by moment by moment, refusing depend, to depend on your own strength, but to moment by moment depend upon the Holy Spirit's strength who lives within you. You must say yes or no to temptation. That's never removed as a responsibility. But you're to say no to temptation and then to choose to depend upon the Holy Spirit to put temptation, wrong thoughts, out of your mind. But if you try to fight wrong thinking by your own strength, let me give you a dramatic illustration. You ever had a, a song come to mind and all of a sudden it bugs you and you try to get the song out of your mind? What happens? It gets worse, doesn't it? Because you see, whatever you and your own strength become more conscious of and try to get rid of in your mind, the more it becomes an issue, the more dominant it becomes. 
You can't do it. That's why the Holy Spirit is the only one that can clean up the mind and the heart.